ready. So my name is Mary Silcox. I'm the Vice Dean Graduate. I'm here to welcome you today on, on behalf of the Dean's Office. I'd also like to welcome Principal Tati, who is honoring us with his presence today. So um, he's the big boss, for those of you who don't know. <laughs> my, my boss is well. <laughs> his boss is boss is boss. Anyway, uh, <laughs> um, so today we're very happy to welcome uh, Professor Mark Kadot. Um, Professor Kadot currently holds, holds the Endowed TD Professor of Urban Forest Conservation and Biology Chair at UTSC, and he's also the Executive Editor of the Journal of Applied Ecology. His research uh, relates to the links between biodiversity and ecosystem function, how to predict and control invasive species and environmental change in terms of how it influences ecosystem services. And he's going to be leading research specifically related to urban stressors um, and how they alter species diversity and ecosystem processes. Um, so his talk today is entitled, uh, Coming to Terms with Changing Nature, and it will look at what is ironically one of the great constants in the world, which is change. Um, the world is undergoing unprecedented levels of change now in ways that have never been seen before. This is driven by large numbers of people and changing technologies. And the impact of this change in an altered and proper world is affecting the world's ability to sustain us. But despite these consequences of, lo of global change, there are opportunities to change, to utilize change to benefit the natural world. Changes in public perception of nature, page two, <laughs> and recognition of its importance have given rise to new ways of striking a balance between the natural world and our own needs and desires. The possibilities of positive change can be best seen with a fundamental shift in how we view nature in cities. And that's going to be um, one of the topics that Professor Kadat will talk about today. So I'm very happy to welcome him. He's going to be um, handling the question session at the end. And then um, we'll have some thank yous at the end. So thanks so much. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? OK. Um, I'm going to start off with an apology. I woke up yesterday with a dreaded throat tickle, uh, <clears throat> and it sort of hit me last night. So I'll try to keep up the, my volume and, and my stamina. Um, but first of all, thank you, everyone, for coming. It's wonderful to see such a, uh, a great crowd from the community coming to the university uh, to hear a little bit about what we do here. And I think it's personally important for me to, to continue talking to people outside of academia and outside of people that work in the disciplines that I work in. Um, so uh, about myself, I'm a biologist. Uh, so as, uh, as uh, Mary's great introduction just uh, pointed out, um, I work on environmental issues. I work on ecology, asking basic questions about what structures the world around us, what structures nature, how it functions, et cetera. And so people like me that ask these questions about the world, about the natural world, uh, cannot separate what we do from the fact that it is changing drastically. So if you see something like this and you imagine yourself walking in a deep, dark forest, uh, wherever that may be, some favorite place you might have. Um, I don't know about you, but when I walk in these places, I'm often struck by a sense of awe. You're in something that's bigger and older than you. Uh, and we might think, just given our, the way our brains work, that we see this as a permanent thing that's been around since uh, before time began, that it feels primeval, it feels ancient. And we see this and we might think of some of these kinds of quotes that people have come up with over time, like, adopt the pace of nature, her secret is patience. Or, Nature's law is stronger than any little law that you have made for yourself. So we feel like nature is something bigger and beyond the scope of our own experience. The reality is that nature is not permanent and its law is not greater than our own law. We are able to impact nature in ways that are fundamental uh, to the processes of nature. So this photograph could have easily been taken in the exact same place as that last photograph. And it, within a matter of hours, could be fundamentally different and fundamentally changed uh, than what we would have perceived before. Right? So you, you go there one day and it's a beautiful, dark, primordial forest. You go another day and it looks like that. It's, it's fundamentally different. And so I'd posit that there's actually a different quote that someone should have come up with, which is, protect nature's law and pace, for people's law is stronger and faster. 
So the world around us is subject to the needs, desires, and whims of people in ways that are, are really profoundly important. So the talk today is really about change. And it's the nature of change, and it's about changing nature. And this isn't a talk all about doom and gloom and all the impacts that we've had on the world. It's really about appreciating change, understanding the change that we're in, and, and other aspects of, of how we can change. So really, I'm going to talk about change in three parts. The first part is that change is natural normal. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the ways in which natural systems change and evolve processes over time. But I'm going to tell you a little bit about a change that is not natural, that is unprecedented in Earth's history. And then I'm going to tell you a little bit about the ways in which societies and people are changing to try to accommodate the natural world around us. So let's start off with the idea that change is natural and normal. So we go to the same forest and we can see something like this. And it might feel still and quiet, there's rapid change happening in that one photograph. Right? From that, I can, I can tell you that a tree has died some time ago, that it served as a nurse tree that gave rise to other trees that grew on top of it and originated from that, that ancient tree. So forests, in our example, are constantly changing. So I think there's, there's a widespread perception, certainly a generation ago, but still exists today in this concept of the balance of nature. That, that the idea that things maintain in an equilibrium, that once nature is, is established, that it's just a, a nice balance where things are not changing. That hasn't always been the case. So we can look back to the ancient Greeks and know that there's ideas like there's nothing permanent except change. And here's a book, this is, this is actually a really good book, The Balance of Nature. I don't know if you can see the subtitle, it's called Ecology's Enduring Myth. So this idea that nature is unchanging and somehow in perfect balance is not actually true. That instead, I would say the balance of nature is dead, but long with the nature of balance. And so what that means is that nature is a balance of different forces, of different changes, of different interactions, of different processes. But nature is very dynamic. It's constantly changing. So this idea of change, I've been a little abstract about it. And I was thinking about how best to think about communicating the normalcy and the naturalness of change. And I thought, you know what? Let's focus in on one geographic area around Lake Superior. And we're going to think about change in terms of a place and then a person. So I'm sure a lot of people here have, have been to this part of, of Ontario or the United States. It's a beautiful part of the province. Um, but it's a great place to think about change, uh, for me personally, as well as, as ecologically. So we have this region, and we can stand in one place. And let's say that we can defy time, and we can stand there from the beginning of the Earth to now, it would look fundamentally different as we move through time. Right? Four billion years ago, it had molten lava and uh, inhospitable environment. 300 million years ago, uh, this region on Earth would have been somewhere near the equator and the tropical. Um, 70 million years ago, it would have been dominated by extremely large-bodied animals, dinosaurs. 12,000 years ago, it would have been a very cold place. Right? It's the tail end of the, the last ice age. There would have been large mammals that did not exist today living there. And we would have seen the establishment of human populations as, as they spread throughout North America. And then we go to the present, and we see a very different landscape. You probably can't see a small picture. It's showing a, a picture of, of, of uh, Thunder Bay. We see lots of human habitation, lots of human structures. So we can stand in one place, and depending on which point in time we are at in human history, it can look like a very different place. But this. Is a little bit of, a, I think, still a little bit abstract. And I was thinking about how best to communicate the, the normalcy of change. Um, and I realized that we can talk about ourselves, uh, individual people. Um, so I'm going to do something that's very uncomfortable to a scientist. I'm going to talk about myself. <laughs> and 
why this, this came up was actually my, my 13 year old daughter is, is in school is learning about um, the history of Canada and its people, so she's had lots of questions about our own family. Uh, and so it, this has really been stuck in my mind. So we're still going to think about the same geographical uh, area. Um, and we're going to think about this guy. <laughs> and the reason why I put that up there uh, is this last name that I have. Um, uh, you probably haven't seen it too much. So um, I realize, you know, we think about ourselves as products of tradition and culture. And again, this idea of this, this, this permanent thing that exists out there that somehow we're a product of. Uh, and when I think about my own origins, I think about just how dynamic and how much change there is in, uh, in, in, in culture and language uh, in geography and how we're shaped by all that change. Uh, so this guy came over in the 1600s from France to Quebec, Pierre Cadeau. Um, and he came over, uh, I, I assume, uh, with you know, new opportunities in this new land um, that France was establishing. Uh, he uh, was quite productive, he produced lots of sons, uh, and uh, they were illiterate fur traders, and they spread across what is Quebec and Ontario. And those fur traders, because they're illiterate, couldn't spell their own last name. That one person gave rise to all these last names. <laughs> and you'll see one of them is mine. Uh, and so, um, and so that's a unique change, right? And so we have this identity in our name. And when I look up my own name, I realize that it, it is uniquely Canadian. It, it originated through linguistic mutation. Uh, and we can trace back to actually the single person that misspelled the name. Um, and it was this guy or his father. Uh, so as they spread out into Ontario, they, uh, they established themselves around Lake Superior, on both sides, the North Shore and the South Shore of Lake Superior. Um, and one of the things that they ended up doing was uh, not only establishing strong fur trade uh, businesses, uh, they also integrated into the indigenous communities that were on both sides of Lake Superior. Um, and in fact, um, Jean-Baptiste's son, also Jean-Baptiste married into uh, indigenous communities, uh, but his son Michel um, uh, became really politically important. Um, so he uh, married into the hereditary chief uh, uh, family. Um, but he also established himself as not only a major force for business in the area through the fur trade, um, but also he was really important in, in, uh, in being a, a go-between between the Canadian U.S. governments and indigenous peoples on uh, the shore of Lake Superior. Um, and in fact, there's you can see signs today about uh, trading posts and about the importance of, of, of these Métis traders, fur traders, in establishing political relationships between uh, the the uh, governments that were established on both sides of the shore uh, and the indigenous people that were there. Um, and then, for some reason, which I've never understood, a bunch of them moved here. Um, so there's a, there's, a, there's a Métis French town called Pancor, just south of, of Chad, Ontario. Uh, and sometime in the 1800s, a bunch of them moved there and decided to become uh, farmers, I guess because maybe the fur trade was drying up. And so they established this, this uh, this community where for many generations my family lived. Um, and then my dad's generation, was my dad, my dad and his siblings, um, then started to disperse out of, out of Pancor uh, and gave rise to us, uh, although they still carry the, the Métis identity pretty uh, strongly. So all this is just to say, this, this, uh, this uncomfortable exercise, just to say that um, someone like me and probably all of you are the products of change. It's completely normal, it's completely natural, and it should be embraced and, and celebrated. Uh, and it's, it's a nice, to me it's a nice metaphor for thinking about almost anything in life, whether it's, it's about nature, it's about place, it's about language, uh, is that the only constancy from, from one time period to the next is the fact that things change. All right, so. We're still in our, our same geographical region. We're still, I think we're standing somewhere, oh, let's say we're standing in uh, Superior National Forest. Um, and even in the absence of human 
uh, effects. So say we're in a, in a forest that's actually protected, we're walking in this nice natural forest, there's still processes underway that are quite dynamic. So we see, we'll see trees that fall, we'll see gaps in the canopy that give opportunities to rise to other types of species. And in fact, if we were to use a computer simulation to model that force over time, right, it's very difficult for us to see forest change because trees live so long. Um, but we would actually be astounded by how much change there is. So you're seeing trees grow, you're seeing them blink out because they die, you see new trees coming in. You're seeing shifts in the colors, so each of the colors is a different species of tree. You'll see some red, then you'll see some blue and orange. And the forests do constantly change like this. So change, even in a protected forest that's, uh, that has minimal human influence, is going to be going through massive change constantly. In the same region, we can think about interactions between animals. So the lynx and the hare have had this contract. And they've had this contract forever, for as long as they've existed. And this contract is, I eat you, I'll weed out the weak, the sick, the infirm, and you're supplying me with energy so that I can continue uh, my life. So we think of this as a really permanent type of relationship. And it is, it's existed forever. One of the interesting things is, uh, thanks to some of my ancestors, um, we know a lot about lynx and hares in this region. And the reason is that because as those companies, fur trading companies were established, uh, the biggest of which was the Hudson Bay Company, they kept really good records of furs, how many furs the trappers were bringing in. So we can actually look at the relationship between lynx and hare through uh, hundreds of years. And one of the things that we know is that they're very dynamic. So those populations of lynx and hare constantly cycle through time. And you can see one of the most basic ecological relationships uh, that we know of, which is that hare in red, population always increases for a lynx population. Right? So once the, the hares are exploding in population size, um, then the lynx will follow that sometime later, usually a generation or so later because the females are getting adequate food resources, they're able to uh, raise their young, uh, their survival is higher. But as soon as the lynx hits some population size, the hares start crashing. And that's because the predation pressure is too high. And this is a cycle that goes on uh, throughout time. Um, as you can see, it's been, it's been going on through a lot of this period of time of when fur trading was uh, really exploding in Canada. Uh, today, it probably looks different because hair and lynx are pretty restricted in where they can occur. Uh, and they move through the landscape quite differently today. So you might not see these natural cycles in the same way. But this is just to say that change, again, is natural and normal. So natural systems constantly change. And that's sort of why I do what I do as an ecologist. We study the ways in which these different ecological forces and factors come together and all this dynamic and all this change come together to produce these wonderful systems that we see in nature. However, there is some aspects of change that are not part of this natural, normal balance of nature that occurs. Instead, there's aspects of change that are current right now um, that are really quite profound. So we go back to Lake Superior. And you know, I romanticize the notion that this is a force and landscape that animals that are going in these uh, interactions. But if we drive around uh, parts of Lake Superior today, we'll see that it's, it has changed a lot. Right? We see a lot of uh, forestry, we see a lot of clear cutting, um, we'll see agricultural fields uh, that span large landscapes, and we'll see human settlements, cities and towns that, uh, that dot throughout uh, the region. And so we know that that this place on Earth, even though it has undergone constant change through time, has undergone very rapid change recently, and in ways that one could have never predicted uh, until the emergence of humans. So this impact that people are having in this geographical region around Lake Superior is mirrored around the world. It's impossible to find a place in the world right now uh, where you don't see the influence of humans. And this global influence has given rise to um, 
a, a new geological era. It's been called the Anthropocene, sort of the era of man. So geological periods, if we look back through the history of Earth, they're all named, right? And some of them you've certainly heard about, like Jurassic, the Jurassic Park. Um, you've heard some of, these, some of these eras. What delineates those eras, or those epochs, what they, how they know there's a transition to a new one is some major event in Earth's history. So it could be a major extinction event, uh, or it could be the rise of new types of organisms, or a fundamental change in geology. Uh, of Earth. So all those, all those phases are something major has happened that you can record and is recorded in the geological record. So the newest one that we live in, they've named this Anthropocene, which is the human era, because we've changed, fundamentally changed the Earth in ways that will be permanently recorded in its geological record. So some of you might be asking why I have a doorknob down here. So if we look back in deep time at, at fossils, there's layers where the most common fossil, intact fossil we find would be trilobites, right? So people have seen trilobites in museums, they're a very common type of fossil, and certain layers, it's the most common type of fossil. If humanity went extinct now, and let's say some space alien uh, geologist in millions of years from now came to Earth, one of the most common and frequently observed fossil types will be doorknobs, right? They exist all over the world, and they'll leave a permanent record in the geological record. In the geological record. And so all this pavement, buildings, uh, changing of waterways, the bringing down of mountains, all those things are, will be permanently recorded in Earth's history. So that's why this era has a new, new name. It's the amount of impact, the amount of change that we've had, is now a permanent part of Earth's history. So, this, uh, this impact that we're having on Earth, we can sometimes see it's very dramatic. That we're going from, for example, this uh, intact, healthy uh, coral reef, which again is subject to change, right? All these corals are constantly at war with each other. They're poisoning each other, attacking each other. The coral reefs are very dynamic, they're changing all the time. But this is not supposed to be the type of change that they, they undergo. This is being driven by human activities on Earth. One of the products of all that change is that we've greatly elevated uh, the, the natural extinction rate. So the, the background extinction rate you see is this dotted line down here. This is what we expect, it's just natural processes. Right? Species do go extinct naturally. That's, that's a natural part of, of how the world unfolds through time. And while there's those extinctions, new species are created through, you know, through uh, genetic or or geographical processes. But all these lines indicate what the current extinction rate is for a lot of different types of organisms. They're many times higher than the background rate. And so we've actually entered what is considered to be the sixth mass extinction event on Earth. Right? There's previous five mass extinction events where there's major change in the types of species that were on Earth. The last one we know well, most people know of in popular culture, which is the extinction of the dinosaurs. In that case, we can pinpoint what we believe to be the cause, which is a meteor hitting the Earth. In this case, this, the sixth mass extinction event, we can also pinpoint the cause, which is one of its own species on Earth that is fundamentally changing the systems on Earth that create limited opportunities for other species or directly cause extinction of other species. So these changes that we're causing on Earth are being driven by a number of different factors. Some of which you probably could guess immediately, some of which may be a little bit less intuitive. Um, this paper came out uh, a while ago and was really trying to think about what's going to happen uh, in, 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 uh, in 2100 in terms of biodiversity, the diversity of life around us. And what they really focused on is how those, those drivers of change that humans cause uh, can impact biodiversity. And so the, they identify the major drivers of change as land use change. So land looks different today. It's not covered by, uh, by forests or swamps or meadows as much as it used to be in the past. So that's a major driver of change. Um, changing climates at both small scales and large scales are influencing biodiversity. 
Uh, and some are less obvious. Nitrogen deposition. Uh, so we're increasing the amount of nitrogen um, around the world, in soils around the world. Um, and this changes the competitive balance between plants. And so uh, plant systems, whether it be forests or meadows or grasslands, uh, are increasing in nitrogen and fewer species are winning and excluding other plant species. So we've seen declines in plant diversity because of, of that. Species invasions, so moving species around the world are having major impacts. We're homogenizing the world, creating similarities in different places that didn't exhort, exist before. And the other is carbon pollution, is, is increasing the amount of carbon in the atmosphere. Also has implications for species, especially plants. So uh, we know that the, the, the temperature on Earth has been increasing over time and will continue to increase into the future. Uh, so you see here a bunch of different colored lines. The only point I want to make about that is that we've got a lot of really smart people with big computers that are independently modeling uh, a bunch of different parameters around environment, atmosphere, and climate. And they all show the same thing. That as we increase the amount of carbon dioxide in, in the atmosphere, uh, the net result is increasing temperatures around the world. And these have implications and important implications for lots of different types of species and natural systems. The other one I think is really profound and maybe people don't fully appreciate is that this is a picture of just the movement of people and goods and trade around the world. All those places that we're moving uh, things between uh, includes organisms. It includes species that may have, for example, evolved in Europe, now find themselves in North America. I can look outside and I can see several species that are really uh, in a new place and having new profound consequences. How many people here know of dog strangling vine? I assume. Yeah, um, so that's the prime example for us. That uh, we have a species that comes from the Ukraine. It's actually quite rare in its in state of range. And it moves here and becomes abundant. It forms monocultures. It excludes other plant species. It, it decreases uh, plant biodiversity by about half where it invades. <laughs> Phragmites is, is, is another one. You can see it down in the, the, the rouge wetlands. <laughs> They're hard to get rid of. Um, so we have these major drivers of change. And one of the things that this paper did was to try to understand how much are they affecting biodiversity, each of these major drivers of change. And it turns out the height of these bars is just how much they're impacting biodiversity. And what you can see is land use is the big one, followed by climate. So land use change, that is, we're changing whole landscapes is having the most profound effect on, on biodiversity. So we know biodiversity is changing. We know that our actions are causing that change. Why should we care? There's a bunch of reasons why we should care. And I'm totally going to avoid the ethical, emotional one, which, which is an important one. But I'm going to talk a little bit about from some of the science I do. I'm going to start off with an analogy. And the analogy is this. Is we have our, our lovely uh, Air Canada jet. We're going to flight somewhere. We can think of all these rivets that hold the plane together as individual species. You lose one or two, the plane's likely going to still make it to its, its destination. But as you start losing more and more, you start compromising the structural integrity of the plane, and the less likely it is to function properly. And that's something you do not want to happen if you're flying in that plane. So species are like these rivets. Right? A few are lost, we probably wouldn't notice a major uh, impact on environmental systems. So the more you lose, the more, the more that there's likely to be negative consequences on those environmental systems around us, and that helps sustain us. <clears throat> so we get a little more detail about why it is that biodiversity matters. Let's look at this plant community. This could be something that we see in the Rouge, for example. Why does this matter? What is this doing? Beyond the fact that there's species there, and there's interesting things happening with those species. I look at the system and I realize it does something different than bare ground. It takes a number of inputs, like solar radiation, water, carbon dioxide, a series of, of nutrients. It takes those in 
and does something with them. Something that doesn't happen on uh, that pavement out there. It creates, it turns those raw materials into, for example, biomass. It takes carbon and turns it into living tissue. It supports pollinators and, uh, and microbes and other trophic levels like herbivores. It cycles nutrients. It creates soil and below ground uh, processes. So this little bit of biodiversity here is kind of like an engine. It's taking in fuels and it's returning something. It creates power. It creates change. And we should really care about that biodiversity. And then the next question is, okay, we, we, we understand that organisms do something. They provide function. It doesn't matter if it's just one species or a bunch of species. It actually does. Yeah, you only have a few species. We have a problem that we have bees. They, because we went into monocultures, wounds that are ordinarily changing all year long, you only have one, and it's only there for part of the year, so the bees start this. Exactly. So, so by having biodiversity that is more species, we see things start to complement each other, that they provide other, uh, other functions beyond that one species can do. And so that's basically, I'm gonna show you what that is. Uh, so if we plant a single monoculture of trees, they're going to fill out, it doesn't matter how many seeds we put out, when they're adults, there's only a certain density that they can maintain. Right, or else they're going to be competing too much and someone will be dying off. They'll hit that density. And for measuring some function, like let's say how much carbon that they're taking up from the atmosphere, they're going to achieve some level of function. But as we start adding species to the system, that function will increase. And you can kind of see why in this picture, is that not all trees are the same. Some do well in the understory, some are, are tall and thin in excess light. But by having those additional species together, they fill out space and using resources more efficiently than a single species. So together, supply more function than any species could by itself. And so that basic premise that biodiversity per se matters for ecosystem function has actually been an area of research for about the last 25 years in ecology that's been really active. There's been hundreds of experiments around the world that go from forests to grasslands to uh, freshwater systems to marine systems, and they all ask the same kind of question. They basically say, does it matter that I have four species? And what these experiments would do is basically take all those species, grow them alone in monocultures, and then they'll put the species together in various combinations, two species, four species, etc. And they'll ask, do these combinations provide more function than those single species monocultures? And so there are dozens and dozens of studies out there that do these types of experiments. And they've been done all over the world. And the general answer is a resounding yes, biodiversity matters. What these experiments find, if on the bottom axis we're increasing the number of species, so they're running experiments where they grow monocultures, and make it two, four, six, eight, ten species, and they measure some sort of ecosystem function. What they find is that there is this increasing relationship. But some of the earliest experiments found that it occurred that maybe you only need this many species to get the best function. Beyond that, we see redundancy. But as more and more experiments were done, we started to see that these other relationships emerge where the, the, the increase in biodiversity looked like it was increasingly important for us to some function. And why is that? Well, it turned out many of those first experiments were really short-term experiments, and they measured just single functions. But as we had more and more experiments, we started getting more long-term experiments and experiments that measured many functions. So we might measure the uptake of carbon dioxide, the support of pollinators, the use of nitrogen in the soil, um, uh, etc. And these experiments find more like these linear relationships, such that we need basically all the species to maintain the functions, all the species in the experiments. All right, so biodiversity is infor important for the functioning of these systems. The next question is, as people, why do we care? We care because those functions actually can be easily converted in our thinking to services that benefit us. So 
this concept of ecosystem of services emerged really about a decade ago uh, and has become fairly widespread. But the idea is that these ecosystems do things that often we benefit from directly or we can put monetary value on. So for example, I keep talking about uh, the uptake of carbon dioxide. Um, well, we know, how to, we know how to quantify that in terms of economic dollars. Right? We know there's carbon markets out there. We know how much carbon is worth. Um, same thing with supporting pollination. Farmers can certainly tell you how valuable pollination is. And if there's a decrease in pollination, how much money it is. Or natural uh, uh, pest control from, say, spiders and birds. Those have real value. There's also some uh, more indirect, hard-to-value aspects of ecosystems, such as uh, spiritual and religious values, aesthetic values, etc. But we can turn these ecosystems and their function into these services that we actually benefit from. So we know there's these drivers of change. And we know that change is really important for us. Um, it turns out it's actually difficult to predict how these drivers of change will, at, in the end of the day, change biodiversity and the ecosystem services around us. Um, and we really want to predict how these drivers of change are going to affect the natural world. Um, and these effects could be realized or thought about either in terms of biodiversity or ecosystem function. And if we could predict these changes, it would be really good for policy and management. Because then we know that a certain activity is going to take place, how we could either prepare ourselves for it or how we could somehow generate those effects. But that prediction has become very difficult because ecological systems, which are constantly changing, are very complex and messy things. And you know, introduce me to one, one concept of a nonlinearity. This is why it's so difficult to predict what's going to happen. So let's say we have some factor on the bottom, like increasing temperature. And we have some response that we're interested in, like the number of pollinators. We might predict some relationship between the two. We can easily come up with another prediction based on our evidence. So say we have data from this range, but from the range that we don't see, it's hard to make a prediction of what things will look like. We can see lots of different relationships. So it becomes very difficult to make predictions about what the net effect of some action is. If we're moving from here to here, we might have three different mathematical models. They all make kind of similar predictions. We may not worry too much. Say, okay, we can kind of guess what will happen. But moving into new territory, that becomes very difficult to make a prediction. And um, different responses to this factor could have very, very different outcomes. Many of these agents of change can be temporary. They can be one-off events, like a chemical spill, or cutting down some trees, or, um, <coughs> or a fire. And so we want to know how a system will recover. And this is part of this prediction part. And so a lot of what modern ecology does is trying to predict the outcomes of these changes and to, and to ensure that biodiversity or ecosystem function can be maintained in the long term. So to understand how systems change, we need three concepts. One is resistance. And I'll show you what this is in a picture in a second. But resistance is how much change, how much the system is affected by perturbation. The next is recovery, how quickly the system comes back to its original state. And resilience, which is the total amount of time that a system is away from its, its natural state. So for example, we might have a chemical release in the forest that affects uh, birds and insects and arthropods. Uh, and we want to know how quickly can the system recover from that. So we're looking through time now. And again, let's stick with pollinators. Let's say we have total pollinator abundance in the system. And we see some sort of, you know, there's some fluctuations, there's some change, but we can kind of, kind of predict what the, what the natural level of pollination is. There's some disturbance that affects that, and we see a decrease. That is the resistance. How much of a decrease there is tells us about uh, resistance, that there's just a, a really small decline, it's high resistance, this is high resistance to that disturbance. If this arrow is huge, the big drop off has low resistance. And then there's gonna be some sort of recovery. 
the recovery, you can think of it as this angle. How steep is this arrow? This arrow is really flat, has a low recovery, takes a long time to get back. And the total amount of time then that we're away from our natural state is the resilience. So we can think of the resilience as just sort of one over recovery time. So if it recovers really quickly, we have high resilience. So why am I bringing this up? So resilience could be affected by either the recovery time or the resistance. So here we have, we have high resistance. We have a short arrow. So the system comes back fairly quickly. Or even if the resistance isn't high, we have a, a, a huge decline. The fact that the recovery is so quick, we have high resilience system. The opposite of that resilience, right? You could have no resilience. So we have a decrease in our ecosystem state, and then it never recovers. This is referred to as regime shift. This is changing the state of the ecosystem from one condition to another. And we, we've seen this time and time again. So while we think that ecological systems are resilient, that they'll bounce back certain perturbations, the reality is we've seen lots of examples where it's not the case. The most famous one in Canada is, of course, the cod fisheries collapse, where overfishing led to a, a collapse in, this, in the cod stocks. Um, so you can just look at photos of hulls to know that there's a fundamental change that happened uh, basically through the 70s. Um, you know, historical photos, people were pulling in cod that were quite substantial. Today they're pulling in these little things like this. And, and there, there's been some evidence of, of recoveries of, of cod stocks, but not substantial, not nearly to what the, the, the state was before. And that's because other organisms have taken over. The food chain has changed, the flow of energy through the system has changed, other species are now more important than cod. And so recovery to original state is probably not likely. We've seen it in Japan as well with sea urchins. There have been declines from in the 1970s and 80s, they're catching sea urchins at a certain level, and now today it's much lower than it was before. And that's coupled with a change in the amount of algae in the system. So they, the actual ecosystems have changed from uh, urchin dominated to algal based systems. And that's what this picture means, is that we see that systems might be resilient to a certain amount of change, a certain type of change, but sometimes if we pass a threshold, we enter new systems that simply do not go back. And what other system on Earth do we have that is more profound of a change than this? And I don't just mean Hong Kong. <laughs> <laughs> Toronto's no different. Uh, humans have built, created these ecosystems that have no precedent in history. Right? We've fundamentally changed the geology, the hydrology, the ecology, the environment of these places in which we live, cities. I'll get to that in a second. Um, I'll get to this concept of pre-adaptation in a minute. So let's, let's ignore that. So why do we have cities? Well, because human population is, is immense today. It's grown exponentially over time. Uh, and then economic drivers, uh, work, resources, etc., have facilitated a shift in the movement of all these people from living in rural areas into cities. So in, in, in countries like the United States and Europe, uh, in Canada, we've seen shifts where the majority of people now live in cities, where in the past the majority of people would have lived in uh, rural areas with very different economies and very different um, way of accessing resources and getting food and materials. So why do we build cities? You know, cities are so unnatural in Earth's history, why do they make sense? They make sense because it's basically an evolutionary shortcut. So any species, us included, we want to be successful. We want to live, we want to have children, we want to uh, uh, have safety and security. And for most organisms, being able to increase how well you're doing and then loss when you leave requires evolution. And that takes a lot of time. So we just taken a shortcut. We said, instead of having to slog out our existence generation after generation to get better, well, we can just create a new environment that just suits us better. And that's what we've done. So we've recreated an environment that suits our needs better than existing environments before. And it's basically about controlling our environment. And it's a really innate human thing. 
we control our environments around us. We shape what they look like. We plant species we want in the ground. We really do have a innate desire to shape the world around us to better suit us, whether it's aesthetically or for our needs. Um, and the natural world for early humans was a really dangerous place, right? They, for, for thousands and thousands of years, human population size didn't increase substantially. It wasn't because we weren't producing offspring, it was because it was a dangerous world, it was a tough world. This is my favorite example. Um, this is the European version of, 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 uh, of a saber-toothed cat. So most people are probably familiar with this. I don't know if people here have been to Los Angeles and gone to the Liberated Tar Pits. Um, we can see many fossils of, of related species. And so for a long time, the quandary was, why the heck does this guy have his big teeth? What was it doing? It turns out, uh, certainly in Europe, it was a primate specialist. <laughs> Maybe the anthropologist doesn't really agree. <laughs> but the point is that the world is, can be a very dangerous place for people. If you're walking down Young Street, you're not going to see bears, you're not going to see uh, wolves, you're not going to see cougars, you're not going to see things that are inherently dangerous to us. So we shape this world around us, which has eliminated a lot of the dangers, as well as increasing security, uh, food security, environmental predictability, right? less likely to have these devastating floods and fires and stuff like that. But cities are not all great. They're not great, entirely great for us, and they're certainly not great for a lot of the other types of organisms that are out there that, that could be there. So there's a number of stressors that are involved in cities. They're hotter, they're, they tend to be drier because there's higher evaporation in cities. Um, we tend to see outbreaks of diseases among organisms usually because they're packed together and they're interacting more often. There's noise, there's light, there's pollution, and there's, there's people. And people are not always great to other people and to other organisms. So cities influence a number of different aspects of the environment around us um, that may not always be good, even though they're a net benefit to us. And cities themselves are not homogeneous things. So here's Melbourne, we can see it's really dense down here, it sort of starts getting broken up as we move out uh, into the countryside. And so what we define as the environment down here can be quite different than the environment down here, even though they're both in, in cities. The one thing that's happened over time, if we look at Toronto, for example, is we look at the density of housing or people. In 1971 to 2001, in the core of the city, there hasn't been a very drastic change in the density. But as we move out away from the city, somewhere between 10 to 30 kilometers, we see there's been a big increase in the 1970s. So areas like where we are now uh, have increased in density quite a bit, and that's impacting the environment. Most species are not well adapted to urban life. Uh, and there's been a, a ton of studies that have looked at all sorts of different kinds of organisms in cities, how they behave, how they survive, how they get their food. And the net story is that as you go from wilderness areas out here to urban areas uh, down over here, that increasing urbanization causes decreases in the abundance and diversity of other organisms. And we see that. Because I can walk behind UTSC campus down to the valley, and I can see American mink, I can see foxes, I can see raccoons, I can see possums, I can see deer. Usually when I cycle in the morning, I see deer, especially in the fall. You're not going to see those nearly as often in, uh, on Young Street. <laughs> so, but some species do well. Some species do well. And we often we don't recognize uh, why that's a really neat thing. And this is where this idea of pre adaptation comes up. So, pre adaptation is the idea that sometimes organisms have traits or behaviors or aspects of their physiology that allow them to deal with a changed environment, with a new environment. Let's take, for example, my front lawn. I mow it to control plant growth because I'd like to have a nice short grass. Um, and I don't understand why, but I know that innately I want to. Um, and I want a few trees in my yard, but I want the rest to look like a savanna where humans originated from. It's in the back of my mind. Um, but there's some species that do really well in this environment of me mowing. They really get an advantage. Everyone's laughing because everyone here who has a lawn right now 
recognizes all four of these species. They're in everyone's lawn. And they're pre-adapted because they evolve in certain circumstances where they thrived on landscapes that were uh, heavily grazed by browsers, even ones that are extinct today that occurred in this region. Um, they might have occurred in stressful conditions where it's thin soil that dries out quickly, or they might occur in fire-prone systems. Uh, but they're pre-adapted to persist and thrive in our, this new landscape. They're sort of lucky in that way. There's examples of pre-adaptations all around us. Right? So we see that some birds do actually quite well in cities. Right? So birds that like to use mud, we have lots of bare ground in cities, uh, to build nests and build nests on rock faces. There's not a whole lot of cliffs in around this area naturally, but we produce a lot of cliffs. Um, same thing with wasps. We have lots of wood that's really predictable and is, is around year after year. And so wood inhabiting species like these cavity nesting bees uh, can do quite well in cities. We have lots of little bits of standing water um, that occur in uh, various types of environments in and around the city, which is great for this guy, but great for a lot of other uh, aquatic inhabiting uh, species as well. And lots of food available. <laughs> it is a great place <laughs> to be a nocturnal omnivore. And so, I mean, everyone knows the trash panda. <laughs> so why I call it trash panda is that to me it's an iconic image of nature in a city. Yes, you know, we all have conflicts with them and they get into our trash and get into our attics and cause trouble. Uh, but to me, I would say Toronto would be a lesser place without them, right? They, to me, they, they tell me that nature has a chance. Nature has a chance to coexist and even thrive in the presence of humans. So I really appreciate the raccoon about what they teach me about nature. And they're just amazing to watch as well. <laughs> so the third part's really short, and it's just the world depends on us changing. So this is a picture of, of Singapore, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, and we are changing. We are changing our behavior, and we, are, we have been changing uh, through policy, through economics, through individual behavior, how we interact with the world. Restoration has become a major activity. And in fact, it's been, this century has been coined the century of restoration. And the reason is that previous centuries were centuries of, of humans exploiting the environment, of changing landscapes. But now, just as common as, as those activities are in certain places in the world, restoration is just as common, or even more common. The humans are actively trying to recreate natural systems. <laughs> and if we go back to our resilience figure, this is when restoration happens. Restoration can cause recovery. So even if we go to a new regime or a new state, there's still the possibility, through our own efforts and technology, that we can bring systems back to states that are desirable. So we're moving from places on Earth that look like this, that look like this. You can almost see, you can almost, or you're unable to see a footprint of those past activities. All over the world, through much of the, the 19th and 20th century, we did this to rivers everywhere in the world. We channelized them, we made them straight. All over the world today, this is happening. We can see it in Highland Creek, right? They've been restoring the natural flow. Um, and the reason why we're doing this all over the world is we realize this is bad. This actually, it might be predictable for uh, transport and moving goods when shipping was really important. It's actually bad for fish, for natural processes, uh, et cetera. So restoration is about trying to achieve new goals with the world around us. It might be trying to recreate some sort of natural state. It might be trying to give home to biodiversity or enhance the ecosystem function. And here's one quick example. I'm sure people here are familiar with this. So this is the bare wetlands in the Rouge Park um, 15 years ago, I guess. Uh, it was a field on the edge of a landfill. Uh, and today it's a nice wetland complex. Um, that's not just one big open wetland. They actually try to recreate a natural wetland system, some of which they dry out in the summer, some maintain uh, water all year long. And one of the reasons was for the reintroduction of landings turtles, critically endangered turtle. So you can see them there today. They're doing quite well. Um, so when you go there, there's lots of turtles. Most of them are painted turtles. You can see these guys with the yellow chin that are smiling at you. 
It's a really unique thing. Um, and there's a whole science now in ecology that's dedicated to these questions. When, what, where, and how to restore a system. A lot of science and economics and policy go into that. So we are changing the world around us through our, our actions. And I would say that a big part of it now is back to cities, that we require uh, to re-envision cities and to think about how they grow and how they develop in really smart ways that allow for uh, enhancing the environment around us. And so we recognize that green spaces are really quite valuable, where we haven't really recognized them in the past beyond the recreational value. But now we, we value them because they can help the environment around us, they can help maintain biodiversity in cities. And it doesn't just have to be public spaces like this, it could be our own yards. That's actually my front yard. And I maintain a, a, a native pollinator garden in the front yard. It could be changes in cities like vacant lots and stuff might offer new opportunities to re-green cities uh, or to use those lands in new unique ways. It might be thinking about basic infrastructure, right? In the 1970s, if we were to build storm ponds, they would look like this. Well, today, this serves the same function and is a human constructed place. It's infrastructure, but it looks very different. It provides opportunity for birds and fish and plants. Cities are full of these things channelized canals to move water during storm events. This is also that. Uh, this is actually in Singapore again, where they had to create a canal about five years ago, and they decided not to do that, and to instead create this, this basically this wetland system that moves water from one area to another. But you can see it's full of vegetation. Well, guess what? When water moves through this, it gets cleaned. When water moves through this, it concentrates pollutants and garbage and moves it to where it ends up point. There's lots of reasons to do this, even though it's probably more expensive and takes more design and maybe more trial and error to build. Well, one would hope. <laughs> Depends what you're paying for. All right, some things we don't pay for. Um, rooftops. Right? Toronto is fortunate. It has one of, it's one of the cities, the first cities to adopt a bylaw to require green rooms and buildings above a certain size. And because, because of that, we're now uh, one of the cities with the greatest number of green rooms in the world. Um, and those green rooms provide services. They take up water, uh, they reduce the reflectance of, of sunlight, they take up uh, pollution, they make people happy. There's lots of studies now that show that office workers in buildings that can see a green roof tend to be more productive and happier in their jobs than those that cannot. All right, so we're in a unique time in human history where we know that the profound changes we've had on the earth. But it's also a time when governments and individuals are recognizing the need to change our behavior and what we do in order to uh, ensure that basic functioning of the, of the world, uh, environment and health, are all maintained through time. So I'm coming back to Singapore. Singapore actually gives us glimpses of what a future could look like. It's a city that is a country. It can't, it can't sprawl. And so, it grows upward, but they also have a really unique dedication to environmental quality in their city. And they have a number of laws um, that might seem restrictive economically, but also actually produce a really unique city that's, that's a decent place to live. And there's a number of examples we go through. We go through two really quickly. One is this, this building here. This is a lock system that's separating out the, uh, a bay from the ocean in Singapore. And lock is just, you know, big gates and water. If we were to build that in Canada in the 1970s, it'd be a big concrete building, a parking lot around it, a big fence, and do not, do not enter. Uh, it would look industrial, it'd be covered in cement, rainwater would hit it, runoff, pollution, etc. This is that same type of building, it's a park on top. It's green grass, you can go there, people are having uh, picnics, flying kites. You can't actually tell, when you come from this way, it looks just like a sloping hill. with a little bit of infrastructure in the middle, you can't tell that it's actually a functioning uh, lock building. That just serves an industrial purpose. These other two photos may be hard to see back there. This is the Kutek Wat Hospital in, in Singapore. Uh, and the hospital is on the edge of this nice big park and has wetlands and you see lots of birds and reptiles. You can't tell where the park stops and where the hospital starts because the first few floors of the hospital are basically trees and park. And so people are coming in from the outside through the hospital, people from the hospital are going outside into the park. 
This is the roof of the hospital. It's a garden. It's a you know, screen room, has gardens. Patients go up and there's gardening and food production. But the idea is that in Singapore, it's becoming increasingly difficult to tell the separation between, say, an industrial building, uh, a public infrastructure project, and nature, and natural systems, and the environment that surround them. So they, because they're so compact, they, in some ways they've done away with traditional bylaw zoning that we have here, where this is commercial, this is industrial, this is park, this is residential, and all those are being blended. And I would argue that, that we're doing that here, but there's some really great examples in Singapore. And by changing our concept of nature, and the idea that it's somewhere else, that a park is somewhere else, by changing those concepts, we have opportunities to really integrate environments and nature in our everyday lives and in our big projects from our small projects as well. So I think, you know, even though part of my talk was a little bit doom and gloom, we talked about extinction rates and stuff, I think there's actually a lot of opportunities now uh, for people, for governments, um, to embrace change, to create a world that is better suited for future generations in terms of environmental quality. And with that, I'm happy to take your questions now. Thank you. you to speak into a mic just because it's really hard for everybody here. So Nancy's going to kind of dance around and bring mics to people. Um, so if you wouldn't mind just um, repeating your question. Um, just, just to say as well, you, everyone who needs a little drink or a refreshment or needs to head out to the washrooms, feel free to do that. We're just going to go right into the questions. So, um, you know, if you need to get up, then that's fine. Okay. Can you hear me? Yep. Um, so the question was, uh, the municipal bylaws that forced me to cut the lawn, um, they have at least changed the pesticide rules so that I'm under less pressure to get rid of dandelions. But I mean, is there not something we could do in that area? <laughs> <laughs> Me personally? <laughs> um, so I think what you're, you're touching on is uh, we have these legacies of laws and perceptions. Uh, you know, in the province, milkweeds are still a noxious weed, right? Uh, there's, a couple of them are still on the noxious weed list for Ontario. Um, so there's a, sort of these, these legacies of regulations, but at the same time, I think, if we're changing, um, we, we need to be smart about change. I mean, you just don't want to let your lawn go and become a weed patch, because uh, neighbors will complain, you have lots of ragweed, there's plenty, yeah. But if you look at my front yard, which is this, you know, I consider to be a beautiful wildflower garden, and it grows, parts of it grow wild and natural. Um, no one, I don't think anyone, at least I haven't experienced <laughs> uh, any bylaw officer coming and saying that it needs to be changed. And in fact, the, the neighbors really appreciate it. Uh, you, you can see on a good summer's day, you can probably see about a dozen to 15 species of wasps and bees in, in my front yard, and butterflies and other things. Um, so I think that there's opportunities to change what our front yards look like. We kind of need to be a little bit smart about it and strategic and changing it to say, I'm not letting my lawn go natural, I'm planting a wildflower garden, right? So just use different terminology. A lot of work. I have a beautiful wildflower garden. I have my lawn is <laughs> purely ecological. That's your excuse your goal. There's one back there. I don't think I need a microphone. I'm a professionally trained baritone, so everybody can hear me. No problem. <laughs> Um, so my question is, I was really interesting, interested in your comment about predicting change and how difficult it is. Um, and I'm from the public policy world where they rely on the accuracy of predictions, as you can imagine. But I've always known that ignorance is the enemy of public policy. So just to give you a quick example, um, you know, I understand that bees can see a much broader spectrum of color than humans can. My father's response when I was a young boy was, oh, how the heck do they know that? Like sarcasm just dripping and, and leading to skepticism. He doesn't believe it. And it's all a bunch of nonsense. So, but because it's so difficult to make predictions, it's even easy for people to make the cry wolf argument, you know, the fake news saying, oh, yeah, yeah, bunch of baloney. I don't believe him. What, what does he know? Um, so my question is, how do you avoid 
being a voice crying out in the wilderness never to be heard, or at least a voice that isn't heard until it's too late? That's a good question. And I would disagree with you on one thing, which is I think ignorance is a friend of public policy. <laughs> <laughs> Let me say, ignorance is a good public policy. <laughs> yeah, yeah so you did say good public policy. Uh, but so politicians often rely on ignorance in order for the public policy to go through. I think the, the, the solution uh, to me is, is evidence. Um, is, well, prediction may be difficult. It may be difficult to say this is, these will be the exact consequences of these actions. Um, at least we can have informed understanding. And we can, we can uh, you know, I'm in a really messy science. Ecology is a really messy science. And so we often deal in probabilities. Uh, and so I think as long as you have evidence on your side, and you can say our best understanding of, uh, of these processes or these, these consequences uh, are really this within these bounds. I think having evidence on your side is always the best case. And um, I agree, there's always a, uh, uh, the, the, the risk of, of just crying wolf and being seen as the, the, the person on the other side of a Fox News interview, right? Where you're just arguing with someone else who's denying what you're saying. And I think most scientists are really cautious about how they present themselves. And most scientists would be, like myself, would be more than willing to engage with policymakers or the public to discuss the evidence uh, in our best understanding um, and to really be the voice for hypothesis driven science um, and to let policymakers at the end of the day make their decisions, but to at least give them the information they need so that they can either say, we're going to go ahead with this activity and they can be clear about the motives because we think that uh, the economy is more important than the environment. And that's fine. If policymakers want to say that, that's fine. That's their, that's their motivation. Um, but what we don't want is them to make these decisions and say there's no, there's no negative consequence or there's, there's no impact on these activities. And so as long as we're here presenting the evidence, it's up to voters and policymakers at the end of the day to make the best decisions. As a resident in Scarborough, which is a beautiful suburban area, we have been fighting the policymakers because when you go to the city and you are challenging a developer who wants to put in a 6,000 square foot home on a property that has a lot of mature trees and uh, green areas, you go to the Committee of Adjustment and you might win and then you go to the Toronto Local Appeal Board, you definitely will lose because these people have land planners and lawyers and vested moneyed peoples that individual community members cannot fight unless they're organized. On the 30th of March, there was a group that was called Tango, which was held at City Hall to unite different residential groups to come up with approaches to help the governments of our areas think more environmentally. But we have been told by the same land planners that Toronto is expecting 100,000 immigrants or migrants, or shall we call them, a year to our cities. And they're more interested in the financial benefits of building and in fact this government that we had is not at all concerned about conservation of our green spaces. What can you recommend to make them more aware of evidence-based criteria? Yeah, so that, that, that gets down to some of the, the cores about urban growth and urban development. And I would, I would say that no policymaker, in fact none of us really thought about what a city should be at the end of the day. Um, you know, 100 years from now, say the Toronto stops growing, what should it look like? And I would say that a lot of the current development policy should fit that vision, and it doesn't. It's just a high of individual activities and people um, uh, obviously going after economic benefits. Um, how you solve that, that's a tough one. Uh, green space can be protected. Um, certainly some, but, you know, that's where biology can work for you. Um, 
uh, in a certain designation of the green space. So it's really hard to, really difficult areas to develop. When it comes to the smaller spaces and properties and yards and all that, it turns out that yards contribute the majority of the green space to a city. And they're quite ready to, they're minimally protected. Um, some of the trees are, you know, being a certain size. Um, I think what it, what it takes is having that vision of the city looks like, and to say that there are certain parts of the city where we're going to create high density residences. And the parts of the city that make sense are the ones that are already pretty dense. Um, and to say that we're going to really concentrate some of this growth in these areas, but at the same time, we're going to expand green in other areas. Uh, what happens now is just as bits of land come up, they become available to developers with, with, with minimal ground vision what the city should be. And we see that in public, public transit, we see it in all the other aspects, but I think it's really it's about mission time. And it's about uh, ensuring that there's candidates that are really espousing the long-term vision of the city and the healthy vision of the city, and ensuring that they are uh, being supported. At the end of the day, that's really what's going to take. The other, uh, your comment about uh, having evidence. I'm an aquatic biologist and a biostatistician, mm -hmm. which are almost two rather conflicting things. Uh, the evidence and how you present it is very important. Well, one of the things that I learned in the lab report when I was uh, reviewing my stats here, actually, and, and elsewhere, was that uh, the reporting of, it, of information has become, especially from statisticians, sloppy. Um, when you read um, scientific journals and how the results of statistical analyses are reported, it's wrong. They use the wrong words. They're not actually reporting what stats say. So when you then use that evidence to support something else, you, you can actually poke holes through it. So we actually weaken our own, find the own arguments by not doing it properly. Students, I don't believe, are being taught the right way to write up the results of analysis that they're doing. I, I actually used to do it that way, but I had to teach myself to do it and word things properly. Yeah, so uh, when it comes to the movement from basic analyses to public policy recommendations, I'm a, I'm a big fan of a pipeline. I want to make sure that trained experts are doing the analyses. Uh, and that they don't necessarily have to be the people communicating it. Um, but there has to be this, pipe, this move from basic science to policy and management. Um, so I, in my introduction, Mary said I'm the, I'm the executive editor, the editor in chief of Journal of Applied Ecology. And that's really a journal that's right in that place where we're moving from basic science, basic theory to management. And it really depends on who you're talking to and what the stakes are. So, for example, um, I like talking to people. None of you know that I do mathematical modeling computer simulation. I just share the computer simulation thing. And so I think it's, it's important to, put, to really try to separate those aspects of communication and to be, have rigorous science that's being done, that's communicated correctly, that's analyzed correctly. But at the same time, being able to present it in a way that doesn't necessarily rely on that until it's really important. Um, so if there was, if, so if, there, if I'm if I'm dealing with uh, managers and policymakers that really need to know the gritty details, then there are scientists who can do that. Um, but if it's about talking to other policymakers that uh, that do not understand science, or talking to a broad audience where I can't make any assumptions about a scientific background, um, I think. It, that evidence needs to be presented in a, in a different way. So I think, uh, so I think there's multiple problems we need to ensure that people have, have both the, the, the basic analyses and are being trained correctly at the same time as the other ways of communicating it. Just the underlying information has to be communicated properly. If it isn't, then anything you build on that is you know, incorrect as well. Mm -hmm. Or at least it's sloppy. Yeah, I agree. It's less, <coughs> it's less rigorous. <laughs> I agree. And one of the, the exercises I like to do is that, um, so the journal I'm an editor of is, uh, is featured in the, in the popular press quite a bit. 
we produce and make some really important articles published. And I'd like to follow the, from the article to what appears in the press, to what appears in blogs, and see how that transition happens. So often we'll have a very technical paper in the journal that has run experiments, that has long term analyses, and big data sets, et cetera. And then you get to the story. And sometimes the new story is, is kind of off. <laughs> I've, I've had stories about my own articles. Um, I read them and I'm like, I didn't really say that. <laughs> um, but other times they're done really well. Um, and and I've, I've, I've come to appreciate the value of the university. So here at UTSC, we have a really good media office. Um, and so I can sit down with someone and they can help write that, that, uh, that news piece or that press piece or that press release uh, in a way that is accurate and reflects what was found. So I think there needs to be multiple experts that are trained to do that thing, whether it's the science of the analyses and they do it properly, or it's the person who can communicate it, et cetera. So there has to be people across the whole pipeline that are involved. To me, that Toronto's biggest asset is the waterfront, the lake. And uh, ever since I've been living here, we've had a gazillion uh, commissions. We must have spent more money on these commissions than we've developed a bit of it in the meantime. But money talks. And unfortunately, what's happened, it seems to me, is that the developers have been given almost a free hand to go in. So there's an area just sort of uh, west of uh, the Humber River there, which had a beautiful little butterfly garden. Uh, but of course, what they've done is they've pulled down all those um, motels that were there and they've put up giant condoms or there. So the butterflies are probably going to all die now. But how do we get people to, who are in these positions of making these decisions, how do we get them to say, well, Look, once this happens, it's not recoverable. We put these great big giant buildings all along the waterfront, and you're continuing to do it. How do we get them to see that there's a future here that let's not do this, let's not build all this crap, let's not build all this stuff there, let's uh, look at the long picture and say once it's gone, it's gone. So how do we reverse this thinking amongst politicians to get the instant money Run. Uh, laws and regulations. So one of the ways in which the uh, U.S. is ahead of Canada um, is that they have uh, really strict laws about biodiversity offsets, or just offsetting activity in general. So development activity, um, what, what would happen is that there would be um, preliminary site assessment, environmental impact assessment of some development project, and whatever the negative impacts are have to be offset somewhere else. And so what typically happens is uh, they would restore some other type of habitat in the, in, the, in the vicinity to at least provide what was lost in that, uh, in that economic activity or development activity. And in fact, the laws go so strong that it also depends on the amount of time. So if you strip down a forest and build some new condos or something like that, and it takes a couple of years before you do the offsetting, you have to offset for the time loss as well. So you actually produce more than was originally there. Um, so that's one way, is to have really strict offsetting laws that any development that removes anything of value, a wetland, a meadow, a butterfly garden, uh, has to be offset somewhere else nearby. So they actually have to put money into recreating a habitat. And, sure. and what happens then is, if you think about a lakefront, there's only so much lakefront. If offsetting is required, you can't develop the whole lakefront because where you going to offset. Um, so offsetting often then ends up being these balances. And can be quite expensive for developers. Um, some companies in Canada already do offsetting as sort of their core principle. Um, I don't want to advertise, but uh, some might have a chair that's TD Bank. Um, they do a lot of offsetting. Uh, so they do offsetting for carbon, and, and they're starting to do, uh, planning to do offsetting for all the footprints of all the branches to build habitat elsewhere to offset those, those square footage. There's other companies that do that as well. So I think the, the ultimate answer to your question is uh, just get the province 
for the federal government to enact strong offsetting regulations that then require that any negative in environmental impact be offset by some positive environmental impact. Those do just fish. So freshwater systems are different. Yeah. But freshwater systems. In your own reimaginings for Toronto, what would you like to see done with Ontario Place for, <laughs> for the land under the garden? Oh, that's a, that's a good one. That's a good one. Um, I haven't thought too much about Ontario Place. Uh, So it's already covered in pavement. Um, so I think that uh, the, it could be used to concentrate some sort of economic or residential activity. Um, if, if it's going to be lost as Ontario Place. Um, to me, that's a prime location to, like we were talking about earlier, to further concentrate some of those activities so they're not sprawling elsewhere. Um, it'd be too hard of a place to restore. Um, that said, it could be that um, when we have these opportunities for a large-scale development like that, we could think like Singapore, and we could say we're going to we're going to re-envision this part of the city and make it something really neat. Yes, it's going to take a lot of money. Uh, maybe we rebuild some of the the nearby shorelines, or we, we, we rebuild some of the canals and river systems that are surrounding that area. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't want a casino. <laughs> yeah. What about under the gardener? Oh, in the gardener. Um, the gardener, you know, I've seen these pictures of like a park on top and stuff. To me, that's really, that's really great. And that could be iconic for the city. Um, you know, cities like Chicago have their freeways go underground. Um, so I think if we want to really be creative and we can move people in different ways, as in public real investment in public infrastructure, or public transit infrastructure, or reconceive of where the roads are and how they move people. I think the gardener is a really great opportunity to have a nice you know, green network path that goes through the city. Um, and you know, those types of things, you know, people might own them and they're expensive and stuff, but really become iconic in the city. And, and really change how people move about the city, how they bike through the city, how they go outside. But yeah, I'd like to see, you know, me personally, I'd like to see the gardener gone. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. um, I think, I think as, a, as a people, we're all smart enough to figure out what's right to do, what's good to do, uh, how pretty can we make the Toronto waterfront? How can we modify the Garden Express? You know, all those wonderful ideas. But they don't seem to have, um, seems to me that uh, uh, short term thinking, um, self serving interest, lack of long term views, all driving us crazy because. Uh, we got great ideas, but never they never get implemented. Doesn't matter how many studies we make, how long we plan, etc. Uh, every four years we turn, we have economic reality to face, etc. So, my question to you is: In your work around the world, as you observe what you do in different contexts, different country, etc., can you identify some examples where people were able to uh, align? long-term interest for the human race, for the community, etc., with these short-term thinking politicians, uh, you know, uh, growth-driven, money-driven uh, businesses to align their motive uh, to be in sync with what we want to do for the common good. Yeah. Because I think the common good is constantly being trumped by all of these other forces. I'm not saying they're evil, I'm just saying they all behave the way they should. So if you look at it in your example of the natural system where there's this natural balance where every species is for themselves, but somehow when they work together, it, it kind of evens things up. Now, why can't we, you know, is there a way for you to see how human beings working together with different interests can actually end up with something good? Yeah. 
That's a great question. I mean, I mean, a lot of it stems just from the economic system we have, where people uh, follow their own self-interest and it's believe that an economy emerges. Um, so the answer to your question, I don't think people will like. Um, there's, there's two, so I've been to a lot of cities. I, I, I look at green space a lot. And um, you know, ignoring sort of the historical green space that emerged before from, from you know, royal holdings or religious monasteries and stuff like that. The recent ones that have really developed green cities um, out of conscious effort have really been driven by one of two things. One is a, a strong authoritarian government, um, and the other is uh, is by rebuilding after um, something goes wrong. And a great example is Berlin. Berlin is a very green city, and that's because of the collapse of communism and rebuilding part of the city, in essence. So those are the two examples where um, where you actually don't need the old people. <laughs> uh, uh, where it's obvious that there's an opportunity or there's a will by a central figure to say this is how we're going to rebuild the city. And so, and so Singapore is definitely a strong central government um, that makes a lot of decisions. Um, you know, and, and in that case, too, China has a lot of opportunity. Um, and China's been changing rapidly, right? Um, all of a sudden, half people can't drive every day in the city because if the, your license plate ends in this number, you can drive on Monday and Wednesday. Um, and that's a strong central government. And they're, not, they're, not, they're not fearful of, of, of people voting in four years. To, you know. So how we do that in a system like ours is either to ensure there's, there's strong laws and regulations from levels of government above the city, um, or to ensure that, um, that projects are envisioned that people buy in and that are so wedded to the identity of growth in the city that they're hard to pull away from. Um, and that's really a difficult one. And you know, unfortunately, it takes time, and sometimes we don't have time because the forces of, of self interest growth happen all the time, happen rapidly. So I think part of, part of it is selling a, a vision of parts of the city that are really compelling, and the other part is getting out of those that are really involved as well. It's not going to happen right now with Ontario, but I don't mean that in a joking way. I just mean that as, as a government with a philosophy that uh, doesn't necessarily support um, ambitious visions about environments and cities. <laughs> so I swing back and forth depending on my mood of the day. Um, ultimately, yes, I think, and, and, and uh, not optimistic in the sense that the world is, is, is going to be perfect. It's not, we've already had that, we've already had that impact. We've already seen um, thousands of species go extinct um, so that, that we can't get beyond that. Um, but we're really at a crossroads and the crossroads are either we say, screw it, let's just go in for economic self-interest, and let's just have a big party. Um, or it's, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna readjust and we're going to prioritize uh, aspects of the earth that we haven't thought about before. And I think we're, ultimately we're heading that way. Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm optimistic. Mark, my question is really around your predictive modeling um, that you were talking about and climate change. And do you see the necessity to revisit your predictive modeling much more frequently? And um, the specific um, incidents or project that I'm thinking about is the, the waterfront restoration at the bluffs. And what I'm finding is, yes, there was some uh, environmental assessment of you know, this particular project would, uh, would have um, the way that the erosion is, is going to be a certain way. But with the change, and particularly in the last couple of years, in the wind and the um, currents, I notice all the work they do is just trashed by the winters that uh, are been constantly changing. Yeah, so in that example, with, with the with changing climate weather patterns, it's much easier at a global scale to 
say, this is going to be the average temperature, this is you know, average precipitation in, say, uh, Central North America or, or, or in Southeast Asia. When you get to a smaller and smaller scale, it's much more difficult to make a specific prediction. Um, so the example of the one location is, yes, we should be able to anticipate certain changes in weather patterns. Um, but what that means for one year to the next can be quite, quite difficult. Uh, so in those cases, uh, and this is, this is something that's being faced all over the place, right? In the coastal southeastern United States is dealing with climate change events, hurricanes, and rising sea level, et cetera. Um, people often talk about, who are sort of at the front edge, talk about resilient cities. And they think about designing cities in such a way that can anticipate some of the worst consequences of changing weather patterns and changing climate. And so sometimes we get stuck in thinking about this place as one project. We don't think that way. We just think, oh, it's going to be the way it is, so let's, let's do our project. But I would say that newer generations of, of city planners and designers that are emerging now are much more likely to be thinking about resilience, putting resiliency into their projects. And so my hope would be is, as those people move into more positions of power and influence, that that, that type of thinking comes in a little bit more. Because you know, we might not, and that's where I was talking about the restore, where we talk about the how, what, why, where, when. Um, that people will look at a, a place and now say, you know, we can't restore it to what it was before because it's unrealistic because of the weather patterns. How can we design it such a way that it does lots of good things but can anticipate those other changes? Yes, and one thing that the bureaucracies are not good at is adaptive management, is to say, here are our benchmarks. Well, benchmark one wasn't met because of this reason. Let's readjust and reevaluate our benchmarks or objectives and to have a feedback process uh, to get to a point um, of being able to be a little bit nimble and change the course when needed. Um, but yeah, municipal bureaucracies are not built to do that. Um, I was uh, intrigued by the, the part about uh, we have condo buildings versus green spaces a lot in, in Toronto. Um, I'm thinking of uh, sort of one example, which is, is the there's a condo development that went up across from the Hunt Club. And the feature was that you could see the Hunt Club, which of course is a private club. <laughs> and you could only see it from the top three stories anyways. But um, some, of this, some of this question is for you know, people in communities to, uh, is there a way that we can encourage people who are condo shopping to, to start to demand um, green spaces and uh, infrastructure around the, the buildings where they're purchasing? Um, are there places in the world where um, this is being done, where communities are saying, uh, or at least condo buyers are saying, okay, well, we want, we want schools, we want libraries, we want uh, recreational facilities, we want green spaces. Are there places in the world that that is being done? So large-scale developments that include uh, green space tend to be more valuable. The problem is that people aren't involved often in the design of them. And so what people might actually want and what developers are building are not necessarily the same thing. Um, so I think there's, um, again, it goes back to a strong central government. I'm thinking of examples in China. That they'll build these condos, there'll be green space in the middle, and they'll have access to all these things. But, uh, but yeah, there's got to be a way to feed in either through policy, so people uh, interact with municipal government to create policies um, that ensure that these developments include those, those amenities and those aspects. Um, because you know, if you have two developers and one builds the, the base development, maximizes square footage, builds a big condo, uh, paves everything else, and you have another one that says, oh, you know what, I'm going to sacrifice the first level of the condo to have park and outdoor space and link to public transit and all that. Those condos would be worth more money at the end of the day. Um, and so it's, it's about, you know, if that's the reality, maybe it's about public policy 
forcing uh, kind of developers to go that direction and not just assume that they're going to uh, build something that people actually desire. So ultimately, I think it comes down to regulation. I think maybe we'll just do one more question, just because we're, we're starting to come up in due time. We have one last. Okay, maybe that's a good note to end on then. Okay, we do have one. One more question. Okay. My understanding. Do you want to finish your thought? Do we have one more at the back? Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, I'd like to offer a um, very sincere thanks to Dr. Kadok for his talk today.